To be serious suggested a philosopher I hadn't heard of, Galen Strawson. And uh, I have a link to an interview. I couldn't find him in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and though there was another Encyclopedia of Philosophy at another university, I believe. But the link, the Google link said it was there. I didn't, couldn't search for it, didn't find it. But I did find an interview in The Believer. And uh, actually, he listed the same four tenets of his uh, denial of free will. Well, yeah. Okay, so first of all, an important thing to realize with uh, Pyrrhonistic skepticism, you know, skepticism prior to uh, so called academic skepticism. The really, even the academic skeptics seem, you know, uh, misdescribed or even lied about, you know, because the general trend of skepticism, and it's very overt in Pyrrhonism and in the outlines of Pyrrhonism, is that skeptics assent to what appears to be the case. What appears to be the case. So logical arguments about what has to be the case, those are always simply. Uh, illusions to some degree, perhaps useful fictions is the idea. They appear to be useful, so you can use them on this kind of grounds, also by admitting what you're exactly assenting to. Attributions of responsibility are for humans to make decisions with. Okay, they're not in the universe themselves. Okay. But so, proving something that we experience, because in this interview even he says that, you know, he, he can prove, he knows certainly that there's no free will, but he can't live it day to day. But to me, this is, you know, knowledge, this is why I say knowledge is demonstration. You have to have something to demonstrate. You know, you can't demonstrate that it's not free will. If you actually act like your will doesn't matter, it'll suddenly matter, right? Because, you know, you won't get out of the walk inside out of the rain and just lie there in the gutter, passed out. So, you know, he admits this, uh, but the thing is, that means that it appears we do have will to him as well. He, he has to have this sense of even what he calls radical free will, which I don't have a sense of radical free will. Um, I wouldn't call it radical, but, um, you know, I don't believe in absolute, so I don't believe in absolute freedom. So, absolutely free will doesn't even make sense to me. Relatively free will, you know, uh, that's a different thing, willpower. But, um, but the main point is, it does appear like there's a will subjectively. Now, if you imagine objectively looking at things in, in this mechanistic way of necessity, uh, an ontology of necessity with a particular kind of pattern to it, it doesn't happen to seem to match reality. Then, from outside, looking back at yourself, you can say, oh, well, it looks like I don't have free will. But see, you never actually get outside yourself. You're actually inside yourself, pretending to have a perspective outside back on you that's more objective. So since you're always in that subjective sphere the whole time, in reality, 24-7 always, you have this apparent reality of will. All right, so it's demonstrated itself to you. Now people say, "Oh, but there's things that appeared." I know. I'm a very I'm, debate me on it. I am a huge fan of the mistakes of, of science and philosophy, and knowledge, and especially how we came to overcome them especially in science because there's a distinct pattern. You don't get to overcome an illusion until you have a better appearance. Right? It's not enough to say that can't be right, I know it's this other way. You have to have a better apparent explanation. That it, something that appears like that explains better than the previous system. Okay. Now we're stuck with this really old dualistic uh, monistic idea of a will, you know, that's like a spirit, is very much 
what a spirit is modeled on or vice versa. Okay. And uh, we can't even overcome that because most people don't have a better appearance. Now, I believe I have a better appearance, and I'll get into that. So anyway, he has these four points. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the first one. I don't know if I'll get into the other ones. Okay, it says, you do what you do in the circumstances in which you find yourself because of the way you are. So I strongly disagree with that, and I've been talking about that for the whole time I'm on here in the sense that this is the error of being. He says that what you do is based on your being, what you are. But you are, what you are is just words we describe you with. You, know, you aren't any way that can be described. Okay, so I would not say what you do what you do because of the way you are. I would say that we say you are the way you are because of what you do. Doing is the material thing. See, abstract ideas like are that don't apply fundamentally but are the useful abstractions like, like, a pro, like a data structure in a computer program. They're useful abstractions. They're not complete. They're made not to be complete. They ignore certain factors so they can focus on others. Right. The material thing is your actual actions in the material world interacting with all the matter. Okay. So what you are is because of what you do. I mean, this is totally backwards. What you do, he's assuming that you essentially are one way. Now, elsewhere in this interview, he talks about, um, you know, that you're just stuck with the desire. But what if you want to change your desires? You know, what if you want to quit eating so many pickles? You can do that. But why did you want to do that? He says you chase this back, and it can't be infinite, uh, but you trace this back, and so eventually you get to a want you had no choice of, so you, you didn't make yourself the way you are. That's item number two. So if you're going to be ultimately responsible for what you do, you're going to have to be ultimately responsible for the way you are. But really, so if you're going to be ultimately responsible for what you are, you're going to have to be ultimately responsible for what you do. And um, that second one is the way, way I would put it, the, the non-reversed way. So, um, I don't know why he puts this word ultimately responsible, but whatever, you know, I mean, ultimately responsible, I mean, you, yeah, because you are all those things that already were, I mean, when did you begin, and those kinds of questions, but, I mean, he's saying that uh, Timothy McVeigh uh, and, a, and a mouse, that, you know, Timothy McVeigh blew up the building, what if a mouse had gone in there and somehow blown up the building just accidentally screwing with the wires or breaking a gas vein or whatever? And uh, that those aren't actually morally distinct. You know, and he says that that's because... Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. That was a commentary at the top of this. That's the interviewer. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's the interviewer's lame idea. Um, he says that the difference is because of free will. Of course not. It, the, the mouse had free will. It's just, the mouse wasn't trying to kill people. He was just trying to find some cheese. But, um, I mean, the question seems to be uh, about the basic kind of uh, the way people view the mind. What, what I don't get yeah, we begin with certain genetic wants and things like this that are developed and what, that we develop <coughs> and already developed before us. But, wait, how much time do I have? Ooh, not much. But, um, yeah, I'm going to run out of time. Well, anyway... I just don't believe this. I, I, I guess I'll make another video to, to go on to the next point.